see uh, a Centennial logo, and GI Coaches knows the overview. And we'll do this in two parts. I'll give a nosy overview, and then I'll buy a project overview, and in both cases, we'll play. <coughs> Is everything uh, working correctly? Can you see my screen? All good. Yes, Carry on. All right. Thanks, guys. Well, you guys know that uh, this is Vern, um, and this is his uh, uh, intro. This is the website, playnosy.com slash a slash gazelle. And the lower right is where – oh, someone might need to mute because I'm getting feedback. In the lower right, you can see Powered by Nosy. And hey, Luke, you may – Luke, you may need to mute everybody from your end. Okay, does that work better? Yes, I think so. Okay, I'm going to leave my chat open, so if you guys think that there's any problems, um, uh, uh, yeah, I'll leave my chat open. Thanks, Dave. Um, just chat to me if there's any if, if there's any problems or challenges. Um, uh, so this is the screen. And what you guys should know is that Nosy is a platform, and the platform is skinned, and the content is controlled by the person who skins the platform. So Vern has chosen the items and, and, and topics in Gazelle's Nosy. He's open to improving them and changing them over time, but we wanted to start with a common set, and then we can add more over time. Now, the agenda is I want to talk first about common ways you can use Nosy. Then I want to do a screen-by-screen -screen review of how it works, then I want to play a game. Then I want to look at how a project might work, uh, share with you some FAQs, and then give you a checklist of next steps. And I'll follow, of course, with an email after this. So let's look at three challenges that I think boil down into one engagement. The first challenge is aligning and focusing a new coaching client on such thing as the Rockefeller habits or the factors needed to scale up. The second challenge is helping a client prepare for quarterly or strategic planning on a personal note, I think the thing that resonates with me most about Vern's work and, and the Rockefeller habits is this notion of the time centricity, the idea that I'm doing something right now, I'm doing something in a quarter, I'm doing something in a year, and I have a big goal. But that means that you kind of have to go back to that. And I think that, that there are ways that we can help prepare clients for better quarterly or strategic planning. And if a company is successful, I think that as the company grows, the leadership team might be well-versed in gazelles, but they may be hiring people who aren't for their business units, and they need your coaching to take the gazelle's habits into the business unit. And I think all three of those have the same engagement profile, where you'll play nosy with the executive team or the business unit leadership teams and build alignment based on the results. Specifically, let's say that you play the game factors needed to scale up, and you see a wide divergence over the beliefs of the executive team over the specific factors they need to scale up, that's something that you kind of want to be aware of, and you want to kind of help them reach consensus on. Because if everyone has a different priority, they're not going to be able to really work on the same factors. Now, I know that um, you have many clients, some in your past, and you may want to rekindle that relationship. So you might want to look at ways to identify new coaching or sales opportunities. So you can schedule a value-added meeting as a means to confirm alignment. And then in the last item, um, to those of you who are uh, positioning yourselves as your own growth company and you want to get new clients from scratch, uh, this is a way to conduct marketing events that promote your company. This is where, for example, Serena Software uses their branded instance of Nosy. They have lunch and learn executive roundtables where they'll bring between 18 and 30 IT professionals into a lunch and learn that are carefully screened, play Nosy, and then they use that as the, launch, as, the, as the launching pad to get into the company. So these are engagement profiles that I think you could use in your consulting practice. Now, Let's say that you wanted to consider the factors necessary to scale up, and you've got these people in the room. Well, these are the factors of scaling up that Vern gave me as possible choices that an executive team might make. 
And, I'm, and I want to frame it for myself and, and possibly for you is I don't think any one of these is the universal right approach. I think that different organizations will likely have a different mix of these factors, but I want to continue to stress that no matter what mix of factors they have, the salesperson, the finance, the R&D person, and the chief marketing officer, those people need to be in alignment over the specific factors that they want to focus on. So here's how you will organize and play in that meeting. You'll coach, you'll convene a meeting, and then in the meeting, you'll host one or more games. And the word host is important. That's the, that's the word we use in our platform. You are a host of a game. The players are drawn from the Gazelle company. The topics that are played are chosen by you, the coach. The process is that players select the topic and create their like list. Then I'll show you those screens in a second. The players then guess the preferences of the other players. You will reveal the results, and then you will review the results and guide them through the results to develop action plans. So I'm going through these screens in a step-by-step -step manner. Rather than clicking on them and trying them out, just kind of absorb this, and then you can use this deck as a reference in job aid after the webinar. So what you would do is you would click log in, and you would select host a game. The next screen is seeing the topics necessary or uh, the topics that you have available to play. Now, I want to point out that in our experience of using Nosy, we actually always recommend at least two games. The first game is fun topics like European cities or red wine to develop rapport and teach the mechanics of the game. And then a subsequent game will focus on the serious topic. So you would literally, in this screen, take European cities, click on it, and drag it over. And you'll see me do that in a second when we go to play a game. Now, step three is that this is the game ID. Players will join the game using this game ID. So you will direct players to go to playnosy.com slash a slash gazelles and join a game. I'm going to go back up in my slide deck, and the players would click join a game versus host a game. Now, starting a game down here, starting a game as a player, means you will be creating a like list and joining others in guessing like lists. When you're playing the game on a fun topic, I recommend playing the game first as a player. It builds rapport. Then when you move into the serious topics, you play as an observer, which means you're setting up the game, the other people are playing the game, and you can observe the results and talk about them. And I'll illustrate both of those modalities of play when, in, in a few minutes. Now, to create a like list, you will select a topic that's interest to you. So I might choose factors necessary to, to scale up. And this is, this is the first screen. And then I'm presented with a randomized list of the items chosen by Vern. So these are the items that Vern um, uh, gave me. And then I drag them over to rank my items. And I click Start the Fun. And I want to point out down here that some topics have more than, um, uh, if, I, if, if you look down here, I'm circling it. Some topics, like your favorite red wines, have more than one screen. So this would become one of two, and then this button would be active. And you want to make sure that you let your players know if there's more than one screen of topics. This is what the home page looks like after you click Start the Fun. Over here is the player's lobby. Uh, in the player's lobby, you can see automatically place players into the game. That's the default setting, and that's typically what you want. And then another chat box that you can turn on after the game has been going to prevent new players from joining the game. Players appear around the game board with an avatar, and various items. The host is always in the dead center bottom, and that would be you, noted by the star. These uh, are the topics that were chosen by the player, and the green question mark means that I am a player, and I need to guess this person's list. And you'll see little 
what we call pop and drops, little um, little uh, I, um, uh, ad, uh, messages that are given to the players in the game to help guide them through the game. Now this is how the players join the game. They will go to uh, playnozy.com, this URL, and they will enter the nine-digit game ID. So the players will click join the game. The players will enter their name and email and choose an avatar, and then they'll create their like list. So the next step looks exactly like yours. They'll create their like list, and then the players will join the game. Now notice that this is the player's home screen. It, this area is blank. The area that you had controls for the lobby, that's not needed for the player, so we don't show that to the player. Now, every player will create a like list. Every player will create one guest list for each of the other players. Um, the, the star is always the active player. So this is the star for the host. If I were logged in as Keith, I wouldn't see a, a, this, I would see a star above my head, and you'll experience that when you guys play the game with me. Now, when this game is done, I can see my initial scores, and if I click Next to see the detailed results, what I see here is I see the item, or I'm sorry, the topic that was chosen by the player, and I see the player's rank of items, and I can see the player's score. So I can see that Luke thinks alignment through the organization is the most important factor necessary to scale up, and Keith thinks that disciplined execution is the most important factor to scale up. Now, at the bottom of the screen, you'll notice that you have two special buttons. You can exit the game and release the players, or you can play again with the same players. That's an important button because once you start playing a few nosy games, you want to make it easy for the players to go to the next game. Now, up here you have a perspective slider, and it says how well each player knows everyone else. If I want to look at the detailed results, I'll click on a player and drag them up, and you will be able to do that when we play the game in a few minutes. Now, when I drag my name up to the top, what drops down is Vern's choices. So Vern thinks the most important factor necessary to scale up is the player is an A player executive team. And I ranked it last, so I actually got zero points from this. Vern thinks a highly differentiated strategy is number two. I didn't choose it, so I got zero points. So I can start to compare and contrast. Now I want to stress that this isn't intended to mean that Vern is the only person or is the only uh, seer of correctness. And in fact, if you look at this screen right here, there's room for other experts over time to be displayed about their perspectives about the factors necessary to scale up. Now, of course, you can understand what Vern's rationale is of why he chose this. When a player is put into the top left, you can see how they got their scores for each of the other players. And you can see that I guessed dead on correctly Keith's third item. So I got 14 points. Now when I click the plus sign, I'll see a detailed comparison of how I organized my, uh, how I organized my guest list to Keith's list. So on the left, this was the player Right, so this was a player over here, and over here, this was the guesser. Now, the scoring algorithm is consisting of two components. There is a distance component, which talks about if you have a direct match, you get 10 points. If you're off by one, you get six and so on. So the only way to get zero points is to be completely wrong in your estimate of the first item. And this kind of matches our intuitive idea that if you get the top item wrong, you shouldn't get any points. The second part of the scoring algorithm is a match position bonus. And the idea is if you can pick someone's most important item dead on correctly, it's worth more bonus points than getting the fourth item correctly. So here you can see I couldn't figure out access to growth capital was number one for Keith. I'm sorry, that discipline execution was number one, but I did figure out the third item, and so I get a match bonus for that third item. 
So now, um, before I talk about managing clients and projects, I want to talk about let's play a game. Um, is everyone with me so far? Uh, you can type a, a chat yes, or I'm going to turn, uh, I'm going to enable all. Everyone doing okay? I, I've yep. unmuted everyone. Yes. Yes. And that echo is gone. Excellent. So I'm going to yep. mute everyone again. Yeah, the echo is gone, so I'll, 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 I'll use the mute if the echo comes back. And what I'm going to ask you to do is kind of watch my screen, and uh, I'm sure you can still see my screen. I have logged in so you can see my avatar. Hello, Luke. And I'm going to say host a game, and I'm going to go through the process as I normally would. I'm going to play with European cities and red wine, and notice our basic metaphor is that there's a paging metaphor. So on page two, white wine. So we'll have red wine, white wine, and European cities. And I'm going to start the game as a player. So what this means is this game is now active, and all of you can open a new browser window, go to uh, playnosy.com slash a slash gazelles, and type in this game ID into that game to join it. Now, if you guys want to really be sneaky, keep an eye on how I rank my red wine and you can get a perfect score. I can tell you guys that I can. Um, I can tell you guys that uh, I can see that Dave not only has is in the process of creating his like list, he has created an account and loaded in his photo into his avatar. So nice job, Dave. You're you're ahead of the pack. <clears throat> Thanks, Luke. Star there. Okay, guys, now I'm going to start to get to work. Ed, you've uploaded your avatar too. Brilliant. So now I've got to do work too, right? Because I am a player and I've got to start guessing lists. Ooh. Hey, Dave, where do you live? Sorry? Where do you live? Where do I live? In New Zealand, Christchurch. Ah, uh, okay. If you live in New Zealand, you're going to do this. Hey, Mark, where do you live? <clears throat> uh, New York Metro. That's not giving me a lot, dude. What do, you, what do you want? Central New Jersey? No, I want to know more about what you're tasting in mind. What kind of food do you like? Do you like fish? Do you like lighter food, heavier food? Uh, all, all the way across the board. I'm not giving you any guidance there because I like everything pretty much equally. Oh, come on, man. Throw me a bone. I want to win. I want to win the game. <clears throat> so is it is it normal for the players to be asking each other questions like this as they go through the game? Well, it, that's kind of how – this is kind of – remember, this is a fun game. And so what I'm actually modeling in my, my behavior is I'm kind of modeling what I might do with a client to keep it fun. Got right? it. I want to I keep this kind of light. Um, 
Uh, and I'm going to get... Yeah, Clemson. <clears throat> now, in the screen, I can see that Dave is almost done guessing with. Uh, Mark is almost done. David, uh, David, um, you've got to do a little work on catching up with us. Uh, you've got to start guessing some lists. How do – okay, got it. So everywhere there's a green question mark on your game. Oh, I see. Okay, got you've it. You've got to guess. Now, I noticed that Tom is on our phone call, but he's not in our game. Is that okay? As far as I know. Tom, do you want to join our nosy game? I could figure it out. Okay, where where are you having troubles? Because I'd like to see if I can get you in. Um So can you hear me, Luke? So who whoever said that I can hear everyone I think. Okay, so it's Tom. I just stepped away a second, so so coming back in. Um, well, we finished this game, so I'll get you into the next yep, one. Yeah, perfect. Once the game okay. is done, it's closed. So we'll get you into the next one. Yep, now let's good. look at this. Um, Mark. Mark wins. So if you guys are looking at the detailed results, you can start to have some fun. Mark, if I look at Mark's red wine choice, uh, white wine choice. It was Prino Grigio, but Mark knew me real well. He was watching. He was he was following along with Cab and then Melbach. <laughs> um, now let's see who knew Mark the best. I knew Mark the best. I guess that he he liked Pinot Grigio the best, and so did Ed. Ed got Mark's number one. So you guys starting to get a sense of how the game is played. Yeah. And you can click on the plus sign to get the details. I can see that Ed's favorite city is Rome. I was I was pretty close to that. I guessed that it was Florence and Rome and I was off by one, Ed. So let's see if anyone got much better. Hey David, you really got much better with uh, Ed. You almost had a perfect score. Had you switched Rome and Vienna, you would have had a perfect score with uh, with uh, Ed. <laughs> Luke, this is Mark. Can I ask a question? Oh, please. <clears throat> so, can we go? Go. Yeah, let's go back to the, the most of the people did did the wine, um, and it's and it's and we may be getting into this a little bit later, but it's the so what question. So, in other words, all right, we've played the game. I know this is for fun, and it's about red wine. But let's say that we were running a business, and we really needed to make some decisions about red wine. Um, so we go through this nosy game. We come up with our alignment and our scores. Now what? Well, how about you ask that question after I play another game and, and we actually choose a topic that has a lot more gravity. Okay, that's fine. Luke, can I ask a question? It's uh, okay. David here. Uh, Dave here. I, I can't, uh, is it right that I can't check out the detailed results? So I, I'm I'm sitting on nosy at the moment with the final scores, but I can't click the tab at the bottom saying detailed results. Is it only the host that can do that? No, you. That's something as a player that you should be able to do. If you could take a screenshot of what you're seeing, I'd like to see that because that's 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 it's either a bug or something else is wrong. But you okay. should be able to see those detailed results. Yeah. Now, Tom, if you want to join the game ID on this one, uh, which I'd love for you to do, is here's the same URL, and the other players should now, your screen should automatically be changing to show the topics, except for Tom Garrity. And, Tom, you can join in on this game. Okay. <clears throat> Why wouldn't we just want one topic, Luke, when we get serious about this? Um, that's actually in the FAQs. Um, the answer is your call. Um, uh, if you want all of the players to choose Rockefeller or Habit, um, you can either do it by social convention or you can just give them one topic and then everyone would choose it. So for the purposes of this discussion, would it be simpler for us to just use one topic for this game? Um, 
Not always. Depending on the nature of the work that you're doing with your client, um, people can feel a little forced to choose one topic. So it's often the case where in the fun game, you really want to give them two or three and then say, okay, guys, let's do a serious one, but let's all agree that we're going to pick the same topic. Right. And then, and so, and then, and then you can do it socially. Uh, so if everyone on this phone call agrees socially to go after Rockefeller habits, then that's what we could do. I just think that might make the follow-up discussion for us simpler than if we had multiple topics on this round. Uh, okay. Um, well, let's. Unless somebody uh, else disagree, unless there's people that disagree with me, my thinking there. Okay. Well, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop the game, and I'm just going to blast through this. So don't worry about it. I'm going to I'm going to play again with the same players, and we're going to pick Rockefeller habits. I'm fine with that. So now if, if everything worked in the system okay, there's a new game ID for everyone. And, and before I go further, does everyone see the topic selection screen of just Rockefeller habits? Yes. 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 Okay. So that's how you would do it. If, if that's what you thought was the right thing to do, we would just do Rockefeller habits. Now, you'll notice that every time these items are presented, they're presented in a random order. So you have to kind of like slow down and read it. And I'm playing seriously. I'm thinking about my own company right now. We're heading into a, uh, a planning meeting next week uh, for us. Tom, I don't see you yet. So yeah. So, so Luke, do um, yeah, I couldn't figure out how to click in. So, what did I miss? So let so let's start with. I'm going to type again in the in the chat log the URL that you want to go to, and let's confirm that you're at that URL. And what you should see is the gazelle's nosy main screen. Um, okay, the the screen that I see is uh, got the avatar, you know, the, the the racetrack and five of the avatars. Uh, it, clearly, you are seeing something that's kind of like what we're looking at, but you're not in our game because I don't okay. see you in our game. So All right, well, I, conti continue on, and I'll, I'll, I'll keep figuring it out. Okay, well, I wonder if you accidentally logged in and started your own game and wondering where we are. So if <laughs> you're in, can you see a player's lobby on your left? Yes. Okay, that's what happened. You logged in, and you started your own game instead of joining my game. All right. So what you have to do is go to the lower left where there's a little wheel, Yep. And yep. click on the wheel and click stop game. Um, okay, I'm at that wheel, but I'm not getting it to work. Hmm. All right, well, just continue, Luke. I'll follow along here. And, and if I need to, I'll, I will take time after yep. this webinar to have you present your screen to me so I can see what you see. Yep, perfect. How are you doing, Ed? I see that you're taking a lot of time thinking about this. Yeah, no, I went back. I went back to pick a topic and start at the end for some reason. So are you, and which screen are you at? Just on the, um... Okay, you just go. created your like list. There you go. I've All right. I've got a star above my head.
Okay. Um, now, as a coach, this is one of those times where you want to be cautious about how much you speak because uh, we've got David and Ed thoughtfully building a list, and you will see a slowdown in play when you move from a fun topic into a serious topic. Because people will take it seriously. They're going to be like, look, I really want to think about what's going on. In other words, move your butts, guys. It's, it's less of a move your butt, and it's more of a, the, a, the realization that, you know, it's a lot different to do this on red wine than it is to – I mean, now, if, if, project yourself forward, right? Mark, imagine, uh, imagine that you were um, uh, with a client, and those clients were, <laughs> you know, playing this game. Okay. Um, oh my God. We all ranked healthy team as number one. I really wasn't expecting that, guys. I really was. I actually wasn't expecting that. Um, I was expecting some of you coaches to rank values and purpose or alignment to number one thing as number one. Well, we, we knew you were going to ask that, so we ganged up beforehand. <laughs> Um, okay, well, let's look at this. Mark has uh, values and purpose and then clear accountabilities. I didn't put clear accountabilities for my team because my company is so small. For me personally, that doesn't seem to be an issue. Um, and so I looked at this when I played Nosy as a little bit of, like, what do I think are kind of the issues? I think my team next week, it's been a while since we've been traveling and we've had some really intense client engagements. I think we kind of got a we, – we, we have what we call our 10 to 10 meeting, which is every now and then we start at 10 in the morning and we go to 10 at night. And uh, we, we ask our families for forgiveness for missing a dinner, but, but we feel like we need a 10 to 10 meeting just to have time together, right, and to have an opportunity to really recommit. So I'm thinking of our alignment to number one thing because I really want to, like – how are we doing in Q1, and what are we really going to be aligning to in Q2? We just had our customer advisory board meeting, and uh, we're, we're going to be processing our feedback from our core customers. I think we want to recommit ourselves to our values and purpose, and I think we've, we've drifted a little bit out of our meeting rhythms, and I want to have everyone kind of recommit to our meeting rhythms. Now, uh, let's take uh, David, and I'm going to drag him up to the top. And uh, Vern has healthy team as number one, but Vern has customer feedback as number two. And I find it interesting that we don't have customer feedback as number two. Um, I have it as number three, but um, uh, uh, Vern has meeting rhythms as number three. And most of us have meeting rhythms. Actually, all of us have meeting rhythms, but for us, it's less important. So I think it's really interesting when you start to have an executive team talk about what's important to them and, and how they start to align. And to, to Mark, was it you who said, okay, so what? I'm actually kind of modeling the so what right now. This is kind of the so what part of it. So it doesn't really matter what Vern's saying. It's more where the team is at that you're coaching. Yeah. So if they all believe um, values and purpose is very, very important for them at that point in time, that's that's where the focus becomes, yeah? Well, I think it's two things. One is I think that, that um, first, I agree with you. I think Vern is, is a, one. We've got other skinned nosies where, like, for the Scrum software development process, we've got a version of nosy skin for Scrum, and we've got five major leaders of the Scrum industry showing not just one, and the five leaders don't agree on what's yeah. most important. And, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to help people really come home with the point. I mean, I tried desperately to get Vern to give me, like, four more people to put into this column here. And he's not ready to do that, although he's open to do that. 
because what I want people to see that it's not one expert's opinion. We always, at, at, in these kind of abstract ways of, of looking at business, we use experts to help us understand ourselves, but we can't use experts to tell us what to do because they're not in our shoes, mm -hmm. right? They're, they're not facing the forces that we're facing. Still can't access game kills have sent you a screenshot. Thanks, Dave. <clears throat> <clears throat> okay, um, any further questions on this before I start talking about um, using it in uh, engagements or some other kinds of things? Do you, do you kind of get a sense of the game mechanics? And some of you talk yeah. about like, well, what if I want everyone to pick the same result? The answer is it's going to look like this. Um, over time, I should tell you that on our product development roadmap, what we hope to do is in the top part where Vern is now displayed <laughs> on my screen, what we hope to do is I'll move Dave down, um, and you see on my screen that, that part goes away. What we hope to do is we hope to create what we call a shared like list. So let's say Mark, Ed, David, Luke, and Dave are all the executive team of a company. And we look at our Rockefeller habits, and at the top left, where, my, where it says gazelles, there was a shared like list button. And I say, guys, it's obvious, right? We all agree that healthy team is number one. And I move healthy team to number one. And then we have a talk, and I say, guys, look, is it, is it really values and purpose alive that's our number two thing? Or is it, you know, Dave has an argument about strategy, and I have an argument about alignment to number one thing. And Dave, Dave and I might have a conversation where I realize that what Dave meant was my meaning of alignment to number one thing. So I adopt his interpretation of the topic, clearly articulated strategy, and we convince you three, Mark, Ed, and David, that that's what's number two. So we put clearly articulated strategy as the shared life list, and that and that's something that we're and that's uh, in our product roadmap. Can I ask a? Can I just ask a bit of a uh, question more specific to my one of my big clients? Yes. Okay. Um, what this? Um, so I live in the Middle East, where management and maturity is very different to what it is out. In let's say a Western country, so this uh, owner of a, a big group of companies, what he's asked me to do in the last two quarters is audit how the different general managers in Syria, in um, Kurdistan, in Saudi, are applying the Rockefeller habits. I wasn't very keen on doing that, but he's a customer. And that's what he wants, and it's been interesting. Um, however, this tool here, I think. I can actually use as a software of auditing because you're actually playing a game instead, right? Mm. All I'm going to say is yes. Yeah. Now, it's not. It's it, it, it's a it's a uh, it's a form of market research that has a, a bias called um, uh, it's called a self-reported bias. Um, you know. <clears throat> People who are obese will tell you that they eat dessert, but in small amounts. But if you actually observe their behavior, they may eat dessert in large amounts. Um, uh, to overcome self-reported bias, the game element of trying to win kicks in. And what happens is, is people enter our game more truthfully because they know other people are trying to guess their habits as they're get or guess their items as they're guessing others. And so the notion of winning the game tends to uh, pre present a compensatory antidote to self-reporting bias. Yeah. I think it also helps them focus and decide which habit to work on in the next quarter by consensus. Hmm. Honestly, if that's all that happened, I would do a backflip of, back of happiness. Because if you can get them to just agree that for this quarter, guys, and that's how you can frame the, the game. Notice that the game doesn't say most important Rockefeller habit. You as the coach could say, guys, the way I want you to play the game 
is not the habit that you think is most important, but the habit that you think we need to work on in the coming quarter. Rank the, the five habits that you think we need to work on. And then this list shows that five of five of us think that we need to work on healthy team. Now you have a, a direct insight as a coach to say, okay, guys, you said you want to work with healthy team. I'm going to go pull out my particular brand of coaching for improving healthy teams. Let's get to it. Would um, Luke, this is Mark, would this game also potentially apply to um, gather customer data uh, in terms of, um, you know, their priorities or things that are important to them in a product or service offering? Uh, the answer is yes, but the, uh, the, the reality is, is that Vern's skin and Vern's topics do not allow for that. Um, so, uh, we oh, so am I unable to, am, am I, un, so as a, as a coach, I'm unable to create my own topic and create my own items? I At think we can use time, one of your other games, yeah? Well, uh, the, the, the answer is yes, but let's go back to that question. Currently, the system does not allow individual login IDs to create their own topics and their own items. We are in development right now with extending the system to create two levels of visibility. One is a public visibility where everyone would see the topics in the game, and then one is a per account visibility. And Vern has agreed that uh, he wants to control the topics that everyone sees, but he's okay with the coaches on their own individual account in Gazelle to add their own topics. So stay tight, you know, stay tight. That that feature is coming. Now. All right, got it. But but there's a big but. Uh, one of my clients that uses Nosy with their customers is Rackspace. There is no way that Rackspace is going to use the skin of Gazelle's Nosy with their customers. So if you really want to do this as an engagement with your customers. For uh, with your client and their customers for market research. Let's say your client is um, uh, Pearson. Uh, they need uh, they I'm need their own guessing. skin. They they need they will well. They ask yourself: Does Pearson want their customers to see Gazelle's nosy, or does Pearson want their customers mm -hmm. to see Pearson? Yeah. But then nosy is not always the right game, is it? Because you've got I mean Mark was mentioning product development, so you've got I can't remember which game it is, but you've got specific games which. We oh, we've, use, we've got dozens yeah. and dozens of games, yeah. and Vern, Vern, Vern actually thinks uh, that I made too many games and that he wanted to just start with two for the coaches. Um, for those of you who would like to learn more of the games, you first, you will have a license to our platforms. You have access to all of the games through this relationship. Second, oh, all of our games have an in-person expression, so you can get you can use our games in person without any royalty payments or any payments to me. You, you can do whatever you want with them. And uh, third, if, if, if you find that this has value and you want to extend, um, I regularly teach classes around the world on this. My next class is in London. Um, uh, Ed, that would probably be most convenient for you, but for mm. other people, um, we're building, we have a, we have a two-day training class which covers how to plan, play, and post-process all of our games in, in great detail, both in person and online. Um, so as you'll see in the next game even more explicitly, uh, it'll be much easier to use our, our buy a future game for client research. Now let's talk about the kind of data that you would get out of Dozy. Out of Dozy, you're going to likely get the factors driving business. So if you were to say play again with same players, and I'll, I'll do a quick one, and I looked at top trends impacting the world, and if we all quit play top trends impacting the world, we can start to look at, from a, from a client's customer's perspective, so if your client is Pearson, you can play with, say, Pearson's customers, and, and then Pearson would get some insight into what they're talking about. But again, it would be Gazelle's branded, not Pearson branded. So what do I think are the top trends affecting the world that affect me, right? And and the number one uh, thing for me is computing power replacing people. 
uh, and then social media, then mega cities. So that that's how I would rank the top trends affecting my business. And I don't think we have to play it on, but that gives you an insight of how of how it would work. Hey, Luke, it's Tom. Um, just a question. You may have covered this earlier, so if you did, then you and I can go offline and catch up. But how do you make sure that the client doesn't get wrapped around the axle around winning the game versus what's important to their company? So just like that climate, or the um, the screen you just had on there, what's important to the from a, a global standpoint? I mean, that's loaded with opinion, etc., which could be very powerful. You know, getting from a leadership team, but if they all got wrapped up about being right. So what's some experience in that? How do you make sure that you don't get, because I, I don't think that's really the intent as much as trying to get everybody to understand where everybody's sitting on on the topics at hand. Um, I actually uh, have evidence that, that uh, contradicts what you uh, just said. Um, we have one client, and normally I'm allowed to name my customers, but in this case I can't. Um, yep. He works for a very large company. He runs a services division, and he has 300 people in his organization in, uh, who, who are in his account servicing another big company. So he's one of the big outsourcers, right? And uh, he lives in Texas, so he's got a drawl, and he's like, his name's Dave, and he's like, Luke, I don't care what my boss's priorities are. I care what my customer's priority are, and I need 300 people around the world to be absolutely aligned in my customer's priority. So this is what I did with my nosy. I loaded my customer's priority into the game, and I keep making people play it until they get a perfect score. So there's some, there's some interesting perspective that says an executive team should continue to play this game until they can get a perfect score, because then what a perfect score means is I not only know my priorities, I know your priorities, and I can predict your priorities. What you get is what we call an alignment graph. Um, so, so I'm not I'm not so sure that that driving people to a perfect score is such a bad thing. Let me give you another example, and then we'll move on back into the PowerPoint to, to give you more color. One of my clients who uses this is Daimler Financial Services. Um, they're the $100 billion bank of Mercedes-Benz, and they use Nosy with their top 100 leaders. And their top 100 leaders don't have to have the same priorities, but they require that their top leaders know the priorities of their peers. So the person who runs Africa, Asia, Pacific, she, Adi Ofek, she has her priorities, which are different than Andreas Heinrich's priorities, who runs the similar division for Europe. They have different priorities, but I can tell you that Adi can predict Heinrich's, and Heinrich's can predict Adi. So the notion of a perfect score does not mean that everyone has the same priorities. It means that everyone can predict the other player's priorities. Mm -hmm. And that's what the leader, that, that's what Klaus Entenmann, the CEO, wants. He, he has told me flat out, I don't need my global team to have the same priorities. I expect regional differences. But I expect that the leaders who need to collaborate know the priorities of their peers. And that's mm -hmm. the meaning of a perfect score in Nosy. I can predict other people. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. Um, guys, I'm going to go ahead and stop this game, and I'm going to go ahead and say okay, and I'm going to release the game, exit the game and release the players, and I'm going to show you, if you look at, if you look at my screen, I went quickly, but can you, can you guys all still see my screen? Yeah. Okay. Yes. If you look at timeline, timeline presents a quick timeline of all the games I've played and all the people who've played them. If I have multiple accounts, I can organize my games into folders, and the initial folder is, you know, my games, which is all the games, but I can have different folders. So I could have, you know, folders for each client, 
And then I can also select a, um, if, if I go back to my games, um, I can select games and I can export the results to Excel. And then uh, uh, what I can get at is, um, let me open up my downloads. And uh, this is the, uh, Excel is firing up, guys. Um, so this is the game results in Excel. And um, uh, again, I'm going to every now and then confirm you can still see my screen? Yes. Okay, so this was the game ID. These were the players. This was the role. I was a facilitator player, not just a facilitator. And then here were the game results, which are the topic and the ranking of those topics. And then we've, we've got uh, ways to uh, manipulate these results, and we're looking at increasingly uh, greater ways of manipulating these results. So, Ed, one of the things that you, we could do with your soft analysis of the audit of the Rockefeller habits is if you really had a large number of people playing the game, we can feed these into social graph analysis tools, and we can tell you which players are most highly aligned, even if they don't work together, based on the way that they play the game and their social graph ranking. Mm. And that's that's part of our future, you know, large scale play. Okay, I'm going to go back to PowerPoint. So um, you, this is what we saw, right? We we, we saw very close degrees of alignment. And you may not get perfect alignment on all top five items. So what we try to do is we try to get alignment on the top two or three. And, and especially when you're saying, what should we work on in this quarter? All you're looking for is alignment on the top thing. Like, this is what we're going to work on. And Nozi is a really powerful way to have that conversation. Frequently Luke. asked question. OK, uh, go ahead. Yes, a quick question here. Do you ever get a situation where the games finish, and we've all agreed for example, that um, um, one topic is above all the others, then afterwards, the next morning, people have slept in it and they've had a little political sort of drinks around the table and they come back and they say, well, actually, we want to change the priorities again. Um, I, my own, my own, um, my own uh, reaction to that would be, great. Let's talk about what motivated you to change. And we may, we may or may not need a nosy game for that, but I would mm -hmm. say, great, let's talk about what motivated you to change. Let's talk about what were the factors that we didn't discuss. I mean, it doesn't, you know, it, it, at the senior executive level, I mean, either you have a genuine alignment or you don't. And I don't want to say consensus. I, want, I don't like that word. Either you have alignment that allows people to take action or you don't. And if if my my own feeling is if they if they slept on it and come back with a different perspective, then Nosy did its job, and so did you. You 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 as the coach created an opportunity for them to have a a, a tough conversation. Thanks. And I think that that's what you guys do better. I mean, the reason you do what you do is because you have the social. Skills, not just the strategic chops, but the social chops to, to kind of have that conversation. And I know you've had them. I know you've, I know you've, I mean, I saw how you guys treated me at the Fortune Summit. I got some pretty tough feedback that was amazingly easy to handle because it was delivered with such, uh, uh, such a compelling uh, package. I, I couldn't help but spend all night long working on my presentation to make it better. <laughs> I was. I felt like, wow, these guys are, you know. So I think that that that's what you guys do. Um, now, uh, frequently asked question: How many topics should I select? We've talked about that. I usually do two to five, but then what if you want all the players to select the same topics and just select that one topic? And one of my players had to leave the game, stop the game, and, and review the results. And so you're going to click that little gear thing, and then you're going to click stop game. Um, so your checklist of next steps, of which some of you have already done, is you're going to sign up for your account. 
you're going to play a few games with your with your team or with your wife or with your friends at dinner. Then pick a project for one of your clients and conduct the project. Whether or not you bill is up to you. Excuse me, is up to you. Um, and then share your notes with the group. Um, that's that's it for this. Before I move into the next um, uh, uh, game, uh, uh, does anyone need a pile break, or does anyone need a uh, uh, you know uh, something to just take a break real quick, or any further final questions on this? I need a quick. I need like a quick two minute break. This is David. Okay. Uh, why don't Why don't uh, we take a uh, a small break? You guys can watch what I'm going to do. I'm going to put you back on mute, but I'm going to go ahead and get to the next presentation and do all that kind of bookkeeping. And for those of you who are wondering, what I'm doing is I'm uh, getting ready for the next set of games. Uh, Dave, you asked if we had been if we had problems with Internet Explorer. The answer is generally yes. Um, the the hardest browser to work with by far is Internet Explorer, and uh, we uh, I'm going to unmute everyone again. Um, we we tend to uh, we tend to ask people to avoid Internet Explorer as much as possible, especially right. IE8. Yeah, IE8 is uh, is the worst. Um, uh, I, I, I generally tell people that I am convinced that all browser authors are sadists who hate all other developers, and their goal in life is to inflict as much pain as possible into any other normal developer. Are you still recording this session? Uh, oh, I, I tweet that. I, I mean, there, there is no rational explanation for why Microsoft, Chrome, why, why. Okay, tell me why Apple would write Safari on the iPad differently than Safari on the desktop and differently than Safari on the iPhone, such that if I write my code so it qualifies on the iPad, it's not working on my uh, MacBook Pro. I hear so you. I, I figured that might have been the case, Luke, because uh, the last time I used this, it was on Google Chrome and I didn't have any problems. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. It, it, clearly, the answer is, is Apple loves developers and wants to make it easy for us to build innovative products that span their devices, right? Yeah. As long as they can lock you in afterwards and take your soul. Yeah. <laughs> I don't mean to yeah. start up a, a contentious subject. I just thought I'd ask the question. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. It's, it's okay. But, but, but in general, uh, Dave, if, if, if you can get people to use Chrome or Firefox, you'll find that... Um, but we, we tend to do a little better, but we're not the only ones. I mean, um, uh, the, uh, most most organizations, uh, most most modern tools. Uh, in fact, I know a lot of 
my peers in the in the uh, software industry who who won't support IE at all ever. They just say no and deal with it. Um, we try to do a little better. We try we try to support IE, but IE eight is is a non-starter. I think what you need to do is get yourself all of these companies as clients from when you're doing your demos with them. <laughs> that's a good idea. Yeah. That's well, you heard the story that recently Bill Gates took a full day to upgrade his Internet Explorer, um, and it actually made national news. No. Brilliant. So you're telling me I'm not alone. <laughs> Definitely not. Okay, guys, um, I'm going to go ahead and get started because we, we, we have about uh, 50 minutes left. So now let's talk about buy a project. And I'm going to go a little differently in this because we've just been playing a lot of games and I want to keep going. Um, uh, let's talk a brief overview of buy a project and then just jump in and play a game. And then we'll talk about ways to use it and how it works. So as I talked about at the summit, BioProject is a collaborative prioritization game. We take 12 to 20 items and describe them in terms of benefits and costs. Five to eight players are given a limited budget. The share, uh, the purchase items represent shared priorities and the chap log shapes results. Now this is what the game board looks like. Bless you. Now, Thank um, you. I mean, bless you. Um, what you guys are going to see is if you were at the Fortune Summit, do you remember when I would switch back and forth to the live demo with GHSP? That game board looks completely different. Between the uh, summit and now, we have completely rewritten the, the user interface of Buy a Feature. And it's more modern and it's structured. Now, you'll notice that in this screen, these are very serious topics, right? 80 sworn police. What you guys are seeing is an actual game board from our recent philanthropic work with the residents of San Jose where we use these games to engage citizens. And in the results I will send you, in the follow-up email that I'll send you after the webinar, I'm going to send you the PowerPoint deck of the results of this game. Now, let's play a quick game. So what I've got is I've got a game running, and what I want to walk you through is the lobby. So don't join this game. Don't use that URL. I'll give you a URL in the game in a second. The facilitator, as you can tell, in our games sees different things than the players. Over here in the left is the chat. In the middle is the wait list, and over here are player slots. And you can see that there's no guest list. These are just open player slots. So now I'm going to go ahead and type in uh, a, a, um, a game. Now, if you are using IE, I believe that we should qualify in IE. Um, Tom, I am hopeful that this game will work for you, and I still want to research what the challenges were that you were having with Nosy. Yep. Yep. Now, as, now, what you guys need to know from a technical standpoint is Nosy is a different game engine than by a feature. So when someone logs in and has a Nosy account, that doesn't mean they have an IGO account. They're, they're separate systems on purpose. Yeah. Now, now you guys can start to see the difference between my screen and your screen. Do you see that, that I see in my screen Dave's email address, the other players don't see it, and then I see a special note, Dave was not on the guest list. So the guest list is a mechanism by which we keep track of where things are. Now there's two modes of chat, there's hello, and there's whisper. Hello. So I'm whispering to Dave. Now Dave, Sewell, could you send a whisper to David? And I want to illustrate yeah. something in that process. I thought you told us not to get on this game on our browsers. No, I, I didn't want you to get on this game using the URL there. I want you to get on this game using the URL I put in the chat log. Uh, oh, I must have missed that part. Okay, so I got to go back into chat. Yeah, and then you can get in this game using IE. It should, it should be fine. We've qualified this game for IE. Now, while you're getting in the game, notice that in my screen, if you, if you go back to my screen, 
the facilitator will see all whispers. Ah, okay. So we don't say anything about the facilitator then. <laughs> wow. <laughs> So I see Dave, David, Ed, Mark, and Tom. It would be it would be a lot of fun if you could join us. That's that's what that's what we'll talk about. Now, I'm going to go ahead and start the game. Now, keep in mind, I'm going to send you a facilitation script. Normally, in a game, the facilitator would be saying things like, you know, welcome to the game. You know, here are the rules. You know, here is the topic you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that would be getting the players ready to play. Just like if you were to play a game in person, you would talk to them about what's going on. Now, I know that we're waiting for uh, uh, Tom, but I know I have some extra player slots, so I'm going to close a slot. I'm going to close two slots. I'm going to leave two slots to play. The reason this is important is because the amount of money that we distribute to the players is distributed to the slots, not the mm -hmm. players. So it's like I have, what, the, what we're saying to the system is, take the money that you're gonna distribute and imagine that you have six players, four that are here and two that may show up. After a while, if a player doesn't show up, we will shut down that slot and the money of that slot gets added to the other players. The reason this is important is because when you're comparing the results, you want the purchase power of a given group to be comparable to the purchase power of a different group. So if you have five players, they're going to have, on a per player basis, more money than if you have eight players. Now, your game board has changed, and each of you have been given money to look at, and we built this game by uh, screen scraping the Nike website. So the topic of this game are potential projects that Nike could institute as part of their corporate social responsibility program. So Dave, let's say for example that you wanted to look at that Nike water program to gain detailed information on the program, put your mouse over it, and you will see a tooltip. And you can see the description of what that program is, and you can see the benefits. And you might think to yourself, this is a really important program. I'm going to put my money against it. And, of course, because of its cost, you will have to convince other people to join you. Yeah. And I'll give you guys a moment to actually play this game. I'm, I'm going to switch over to talk with Tom. Tom, how you doing? Uh, I'm watching. I, so we'll go offline and I'll figure out what I've not done right, but I'm following along with you. Okay. So you're for sure not wanting to play? Well, I can't figure out how to get in, and instead of taking up time here with everybody, I'll just kind of follow along, and then you and I could go offline and we'll figure well, out what I'm... Why don't we do this? While we're waiting for them, could you open up a browser and try typing in that URL? that I put in, or clicking on that URL that I put into the chat. Uh, okay, so where do I bring that up? Okay, if you go to the Go to Meeting Control panel, yep. you will see a chat facility at the lower, uh, at the bottom. Pull down the chat. Maybe I'll, I'll do it another way too. I'll do it this way. I'm sending you a, game, a, a link. Okay. Via email. So I, I just sent you the game link via email. Maybe email will work more conveniently. All right. So go back to email, pick up your message, and click on. Mm hmm Okay. Now, Dave and David, Ed and Mark, I would recommend just going ahead and, and making a few bids just to get things started. Well, when you say make a bid, what are you? What are we yeah. filling in? You're you. Uh, I see David and Dave just did it. So David or Dave, how do you make a bid? You just enter uh, it in a just, box. 
Yeah, just put your cursor into the box and put your the amount of dollars you want to bid into that box. Mm -hmm. um, now, I've noticed that Dave and David have overbid. Um, that's not required in this game. In some games, you can overbid, but that's not actually required. Hey, Luke, Tom, what password should I use? Um, well, you should use the password that you have previously registered for an account in our system. All right. If you can't remember it, just type in a fake email address. Because what the system is doing is saying, hey, I know this guy because I've, I've seen his email before, and he has an account. But if you want to be anonymous to our system, just type in a, a, a fake email address, if you will. Okay. Now I'm coming in, and you see, oh, there it is. Can, please, please, everyone, take a moment from being out of the game and looking at my screen. When a facilitator is in the middle of a game and someone asks to join, you get a join request. So I'm going to allow Tom in the game. We were playing much gonna... better without Tom. <laughs> Come on, Eddie. Come on, Eddie. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to deny me. Now, notice what happens to your money when I close the empty slot. So can you see that empty slot? I'm yeah. going to go ahead and close it, and boom, you all have more money. But now this game is completely locked. You cannot add any players to the game because there's no more slots. Okay, so what are we doing? Oh, so if I'm bidding on something that already has enough money, I can reallocate my money, right? That's right. It's a collaborative uh, purchase, not a competitive purchase. How do I delete a bid? Uh, go into the cell and change it. Make it zero. Oh, there we go. Tom, you can't be a tech neophyte. You're doing great. So if I've got 15 with reduced waste and no one else is in, I can take it out and add it to something else, yeah? Or hey, I'm, you, I'm, should, you should yeah. try and convince them to join you. Don't, don't give up, Ed. Give them a I'm, reason I'm, to I know, no, Tell them, but, tell them why reducing waste is better than energy and CO2 footprint. Well, then I'd look at the Nike water program. I think that's probably got a better chance of uh, getting towards it. But the goal is to 
the whole the goal is to to get the items that have the highest impact, not the ones that can win, and and argue for it. Now, this is a, yeah. this is this is hard to simulate because you guys don't care about these. But when you mm -hmm. put the actual project portfolios or actual features of a client uh, uh, stuff into this game, you will see some very vigorous debates. There, we only need 13 more dollars for the Nike water program. I think Mark's that? got the money. <laughs> who, said that? who said that? All of you can control purchasing the Nike water program. You are all close enough that you can change bids in any one area to get there. So, for example, Ed, if you really want the Nike water program, you can, can you could yeah. unpurchase Road to Zero and get it. So I can just go say, um, and where's the subtotal? Oh, on, on the right-hand side. Yeah. Because so I can't see the very final column. I can see. David could move his money from uh, the energy and CO2 footprint, which mm. has nobody else on it. Which, which he did. Just done. There you go. Way, hey, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Save the world. <laughs> yeah. Um, Still one of the lead standard. <laughs> we're we're gonna we're gonna merge the two columns in the next rev of the system. We're merging the two columns on the far right into one column because we realize you don't need total bid and need. You just need you just need the need column. Yeah. And we're gonna move the need column to the left. So you'll see the item, the cost, the need, and then the players. Yeah, that's so better. we've done we've done a little bit of usability testing and we can make another improvement on that. But are you guys Satisfied with your bids? I mean, this is where a facilitator would, you know, keep asking, you know, are you satisfied with your bids? Are you satisfied with your purchases? Mm -hmm. You know, David and Dave, you've got items that are that are, you know, not not completely purchased, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So ultimately, um, um, this is this is the buy a project game, which when used internally is a portfolio prioritization across the enterprise. And by a feature game, when used externally, as a form of really, really powerful market research and customer insight. Are you getting many startups using this when it comes to um, sort of the lean startup cycle? Indeed, there's a story of Pandora who runs their entire product process using this. Oh, do they? Yeah, um, Pandora. Uh, product. That's the radio people, yeah. Yeah. Um, they use this. They use this uh, quite successfully. <coughs> how do they use it? Can you can you tell us how they do it? Uh, they let their, they put the features available for purchase uh, to their uh, um, uh, to their engineers. They give engineers money, and then they aggregate the results across the game. Oh. So, what about do some companies do that also with clients? You know, when you're doing yeah, your customer jobs and pains thing. 
That's exactly right. So the question is, so, so the dimensions of play are, what are the content? If the content is projects in my project portfolio, like should I start a Pinterest project or should I start a Twitter project or should I have a Facebook page, the players will be internal because customers don't care about your projects. If the content are possible product features, then the players should be your customers and playing the game is a form of market research that provides insight into the highest priority features. That makes sense. What's the maximum number of players, Luke? Um, in this game, you can stretch it to 10, but more than 10 um, becomes really unwieldy to manage the, the negotiations. Um, we've done games for people like Cisco where, where we've done 30 and 40 and 50 games um, where they've wanted hundreds of people involved, but then we just use data analytics to, to, to analyze and manage the results across a set of games. So if I stop this game and I go back into my account and I look at my Nike corporate social responsibility features game and I select the three games that I've played and I say give me the results of those games, I can see a results summary that across these games the positive chemistries program was purchased in three out of three games. The energy and CO2 footprint assessment was purchased in two out of three games and bid on one, so it ranked higher than the improved packaging project, which was only purchased in two games. So you can see that complete purchases rank higher than partial purchases, the bids. And I, and I think we should, we're, we're going to change this from full purchase to partial purchase. And then uh, reduced waste in manufacturing was not bid on in any game. So that's where you would start to use our data analytics to, to understand uh, the, the, the structure of the game. I read in one of, I think in the book, uh, a situation where one of your clients, I can't remember which one it was, played a game and the senior management team still chose to go ahead with something which had zero votes. That's correct. And the chat logs indicated that no one understood what the project was and therefore mm -hmm. they, they didn't bid on it. In working right. with the senior leadership team, we said, if, if you, you know, because the senior and the year leadership team is kind of freaking out. They're like, what do we do? You know, this is critical to our future, and no one in our distributed organization purchased it. And our response was, look, if, if you're leaders, you have to lead, right? You have to make these kind of calls. But now you, you, you really need to put an education program in place to explain this mm -hmm. choice so that people know why you're doing it. And it worked out great. As opposed to the normal process, where the leaders would just make the decision and assume that people know what's going on, and that was in yeah that was in my book in the um, in the uh, prioritization portfolio book. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint um, and and give you kind of the overview of the you know we played a quick game. So let's look at some of the ways that you guys can use by a project. I think what you're going to find is Nosy gives you initial quick hits with your clients, and by a project gives you more substantive engagement because you'll play more by a project games. So let's say that you wanted to help a client prioritize quarterly or annual projects at a corporate or BU level. Um, this is, by the way, this is the single item that motivated Vern to make his investment in my company. He thinks, in the conversations I've had with him, uh, he said, I just see this, I see so many companies struggle with prioritization. I see so many executives wanting to include their team in the process and not having the tools. This is a breakthrough tool for getting teams to collaboratively prioritize stuff. Um, he, he just thinks that it, it's so hard for people to prioritize 
and 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 he what what Vernon told me is he sees this sea change where executives are really trying to be more inclusionary. They're trying to include their organization in these decisions, but they don't have the means or the tools to do it. Um, and that's what we're trying to provide. Then you have a client prioritize process or operations improvement efforts or a client conduct market research. The process is exactly the same, and I hope you guys have been reading it, right? You're going to confirm the goals and desired outcomes. You're going to create the list of projects with the description and the prices. You're going to schedule the games. Um, we usually find that five games gives an absolutely clear pattern of preferences within a group of players. You're going to facilitate the games, and I want to make a really important point here. Not only are multiple facilitators um, uh, okay, um, they're often desired to reduce research bias. So when I did my games for the city of San Jose, I didn't facilitate all of those online games. I had a bunch of facilitators facilitate those online games, and our system allows you to uh, create a game and then say that other people are going to facilitate it. And then, of course, you're going to analyze the results and prepare the recommendation. Hey, Luke. Yes. So I don't get the, the part about five games is the optimal number of games. I mean, are you taking the same eight people through the same game five times? No, and I don't want to say – I want to be very careful. We see a minimum of five games as providing highly impactful results provided those games are played with multiple players or different players. And what, we're, what we are finding is that, that that's based on research conducted by a woman named Abby Griffiths from the University of Illinois. And so what you're saying is, basically what I'm saying is get 40 people's opinion. Five games of eight players would be somewhere about to between 30 and 40 people if you can get their opinion and you look at their results, um, and let's go back to the results of our own game, right? We, we played three games with about 15 people now, right? Game one had a few people, game two, game three. And in all three games, the Positive Chemistries program was purchased. That's a signal that that's a more important feature. And the question is, is it statistically significant? No, of course not. It's, it's qualitative market research. But as a highly impactful, more actionable form of market research, I can go into those games and look at the chat logs and understand why that item was purchased. Does that answer your question, or do you want to talk about that? Yeah, again? no, it does. I, I guess I'm, I'm also starting to question, like, the logistics here. So, you know... So if we're running five games with 40 people, right, okay. uh, how long does each game take? Is this done remotely usually, kind of like we are today, or, you know, would I be on site for, for a day bringing the people who are playing the game into the same room but have different screens that they're looking at? Um, like, so how, how would this actually work? So if I wanted to do this with a client of mine, we had 40 people, um, can you just kind of walk me through how you would set it up if it was you? Sure. Um, uh, let's say that, uh, again, I'm, for lack of a better term, I'm just looking at my bookshelf and I'm thinking Pearson because it's loaded with Pearson books. Um, full disclosure, I'm a Pearson author, so I have a lot of Pearson books. Once you become an author, they send you books for free forever. It's amazing. <laughs> um, so I have a Pearson. Let's say that Pearson had a 20-project portfolio for their marketing team. I and, I and I and someone said, I really need some help in prioritizing this project portfolio. I'd say, great. Give me the list of people that you're willing to listen to. Right? It's not any employee at Pearson, maybe not, no, no offense, but you know, the admin in the front of the building, they don't really get a vote in the project portfolio. So let's say they had a list of people in their marketing organization that was maybe 150 people, okay? And that's who they're willing to have play the game. And 
and and we know that not every person is going to play it because of logistics reasons. I'd say, okay, guys, 150 people. That's a really good number. We're going to target. We're going to target 40 of those people, and we're going to try and play five games. Now, what I would do is I wouldn't want to facilitate each game on my own because I think, as a market researcher, that would introduce a little bit of bias. So I would go into my team, and I'd probably bring Laura Richardson, who's my VP of sales, or Tammy Carter, who's my VP of marketing, or maybe some other colleague who I've worked with in the past. So let's say it's Luke and... Uh, and Deb Colden, who's who's a who's a person I've worked with in the past. So my my facilitation team is Luke and Deb, and I want five games across these 150 people. What we do is we go to a a, a, a tool called Doodle, D O O D L E dot com, and Doodle allows you to list time slots that people select their availability. To, to have a meeting. So I would go to Deb and, and I'd say, Deb, what are the times that you have available? And I would look at what are the times that I have available. And then I would send out that doodle poll to those 150 people. When the doodle poll comes back, I would pick eight people to play game one, eight people to play game two, eight people to play game three. And may, I, maybe I'd pick ten people because some people might show up. And then once I've got those people... I schedule the games and I play them. According how much time? The, how much time do you budget per game? Uh, an hour is more than sufficient. <clears throat> and uh, to, to further answer your question, um, I would strongly recommend that you do this remotely. Uh, there's no requirement that they're in the same room. Um, uh, th th you would do it the way we're doing it now. I would not use a conference call line. We actually find that conference calls disempower women and disempower people who speak English as a second language. The chat facility neutralizes the, the, contra uh, the, the, the notion of body language and voice and tone inflection, and it provides an equal footing for people who don't speak English as a primary language. They, ne they literally negotiate better. You will see that in some of the chat logs that I send you in the report from our San Jose games. Okay. So let's talk about some of these differences between Nosy and Via Project. Where you play them, Gazelle and Nosy, you're typically going to play them in the same room. Via Project, you're typically going to play it online. In terms of scheduling, Gazelle's Nosy is you're not scheduled before the meeting. You're just going to show up in the meeting and say you're going to play Nosy, hit start a game, and away you go. Typically, for buy a project, you're going to schedule uh, beforehand, and we call those things parties. I'll show you that screen in a little bit. In Gazelle's Nosy, you, we've shown that you'll usually play the first game as a player and subsequent games as an observer. In buy a project, you will never be a player. You're always an observer, meaning you don't get money as a host. Did you see that when I was playing with you, I didn't get any money. It was only you guys who got the money. Scalability, Gazelle's Nosy is really designed for intimate conversations in a single group, whereas by a project can be scaled to many simultaneous games with multiple facilitators. So let's go back to our client who wants to play five games. You could, If you had five facilitators, you could play all five games at the same time at, you know, at 1 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, all five games could play. Each facilitator would facilitate their own game, and all of the results of those games would go into your account for analysis. So far so good? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Now, the analyzing of the game results is you're going to look at who purchased what, how much did they bid, which is a form of intensity, who negotiated with whom, with whom, what did they say, and how did that shape the projects. And you'll often find that there's conditions of acceptance, like um, Alice joined Bonnie on, on Project E, 
and Alex might say, you know, I really think that this is the right thing to do, provided it also handles the upgrades of customers who are on an older version of our system, something like that. Now, this is the, I think it was Ed who talked about that this is in my book. Yeah. We did a, a, a project for Verisign where the leadership project was, was way out here. And what we did was we said, yes, green light that project, but they needed to educate to build trust. Now, these projects were easy to agree to because they were the employees' projects. Now, one thing that I didn't say in my book and I didn't say at the summit that I want you guys to know, there's, as near as we can tell, there's no correlation between the purchase price of a project and its perceived value, meaning this project right here that the employees chose as number one across all those games, it was the most expensive item. So just as, you know, we, we have this fallacy like, oh, when it's cheap, people will buy it. When it's expensive, they'll shy away because they're risk averse. It's actually not true. If, if that expensive project really does materially affect the organization or the employee's ability to serve that organization, they'll buy it. This is the games aligning leaders to teams, and I showed this at the summit, where uh, the first two projects, Mobile One and Mobile Two, had, had perfect alignment. Down here, the innovation project, the executives didn't want it, and the leaders did, the extended leadership team. So they said, let's do this. And this is your coaching. Your coaching is looking at these results. And, uh, and um, back to whoever asked the question about the players, these were all unique players in the game and, and showing that this is the, the will of the team. And then finally, this is the, where the games align teams to each other. Katarina says, I don't work for sports, but I'm putting money into a sports project. And I thought that was really pretty interesting. You can see that in the, in the bid behavior, Katarina here is putting money into sports projects, uh, sports uh, right here, even though she doesn't work in the sports division. And a fairly large chunk of money. Luke? Yes. How uh, difficult is it to get a team to actually start using the chat function appropriately if this is the first time they're playing? Well, you're asking a, a really good question, I think, about game psychology. And let's just think about any game, right? When you go buy a new board game for your kids or your family, uh, the first thing you do is you rip it open and you start to play, and then you look at the rules. And so that's why in Nosy, uh, we have a phrase in our company, Mark, that says to play the game, first you need to play a game. So sometimes what we'll do with a company is we'll, we'll pick a standard game or a fun game, and you'll get one of the fun games in, our, uh, in my follow-up email. And we'll say, imagine that we were prioritizing features for a new coffee maker, or imagine we were... I, I, and I don't want to uh, offend anyone's um, preferences about what they drink, but we have a fun game that says it's, it's the party drink planner. I'm, I'm planning a party, and I can get beer and wine and, and whiskey and mixed drinks, but I only have so much money, and I play the game as if you guys were coming to my house and you guys were buying the alcohol that you wanted at the party. And so once you play a game, people kind of get the mechanics, and then they realize that, that if they want to negotiate, they've got to use the chat functionality and they've got to negotiate well. In practice, we don't see this as a problem. I mean, when, like, I'll give you, let me, let me open up a, a, a deck just so you guys can see this. Um, uh, uh, um, when I, in, in the San Jose budget games, and I'm sending you a copy of this, this this deck shows you what we did in San Jose in January where we had in-person and then online. Just look at this. The, the blue represents a chat from a chat log of a citizen. The purple represents a, a chat and a reply from citizens in the game. Now, Mark, these are citizens who never played our game before, and this is what they're putting into our chat logs.
Right. This is what they said about police. Two different games. Great. So, and, and then this is what they actually said about our game. And so, again, if we're facilitating this remotely, there's no conference call that people are dialing into. They're just logging into the game, and then as the facilitator, I'm greeting them in the chat function. That's right. And, and, and we will give you a chat log, or we will give you a facilitation script that you can tune. And the facilitation script is, hello, you know, there's some obvious stuff, social, right? Hello, how are you? The purpose of this game is to prioritize the Nike corporate social responsibility programs. You'll be given a little bit of money, you know, is everyone ready? Are you ready to play, et cetera? So that's, that's, where, um, uh, th that's where those things come in. Now let's, let's, let's pick up um, uh, uh, this, this deck. Um, this you can come back to. The point is that we've been starting to formally study our games. And we're finding that the degree of involvement and the degree of engagement significantly improve within an organization as they play the games, significantly. And when you play it with customers as a form of market research, customers love it. So these are three games that we played for a company called Version 1, which does uh, software analytics. And these are the verbatims from the customers playing the game. I mean, when was the last time you had someone say thank you for a survey or they enjoyed a survey? It's the collaborative nature that binds people into this process. It's really amazing. I love this, this particular quote down here with Andre. If I'm going to circle it. It was hard, but lots of fun. People who are arguing over the most important features for a future product release will find it's hard, but they'll also be satisfied. Okay, we've got about uh, 10 minutes to go. Um, so there's a couple of things that you need to know heading into this is that one of the most important questions is what if you have more than 20 items? Well, recently we had the Olympics, and so we know how the Olympics solves the problem of having more than 20 skaters, we run tournaments, or uh, we run a tournament structure with multiple heats. So imagine that you had 60 items in your project portfolio that you wanted to prioritize. We would randomly sort them, play the level one games with 20 items, and the items purchased in the level one games would be promoted into the subsequent games. Now, Creating by a project games are more work than playing a nosy game because you have to create the game content. So this is the part of this, of this presentation that we may not uh, be able to get to, but this is the system guide. And it talks about uh, the things that you saw on my screen, the project organizer, how games are organized, the, the coffee flow games, the, the presentation overview, the game results down here at the at the bottom. The things that you can do. So in my if I go back to my project organizer, this is this is my project organizer. These are the different things I can do with game artifacts and the games themselves. Um, and this kind of talks about, you know, let's say you're a product manager for Coffee Co. You want to prioritize features. You've got rough estimates of the cost. So I would click add project. I'd type in my project name. I'd click the Add Game button to the top left. I'd create a Buy a Feature Game. This is our system for typing in a game. 
So this is where you could, you know, if I wanted a new game here, this is where I would type in add game, buy a feature, create, and this is where I would type in my, you know, um, Pearson marketing uh, portfolio. And notice that you can change the, the currency symbol and things like that. And I could type in the game items, like this could be, you know, Facebook page, and you can describe them, or you can use an Excel spreadsheet, and most of the time I find it convenient to use Excel. I get all my information ready in Excel, and then I just import that into the system and I'm ready to play it. Um, and this is how you would do it. You just click on the import button, choose the file, import it, and then edit it. And then to, to organize the game, mark to, to this notion of how do I organize games, we call those a party. So once I have a game, I go through a sequence of four steps to invite players. I click on the party button, and the first thing I'm doing is setting up the logistics. When is the game going to be played? Who is going to facilitate it? And that's down here. So I can say me or someone else. So let's say, Mark, let's say that you and I um, were, were working on a project together for Nike, and I really needed your help. In this screen, I would say this would be like my Nike, you know, Nike Team 2, and it's going to be March 27th at, you know, 10 a.m., and I'm going to have Mark Green be the facilitator. And I am the producer, so the game results go into my account, but you're the facilitator. So when you click on that link, Mark, the system is going to say, Mark, you're the facilitator, so you get control of the lobby, and you'll be managing that game play. Now, the rest of this is this notion of a guest list. I didn't indicate this, but if I were to schedule this game, this is where I would put, you know, Dave, and I would type in Dave's email address, right? And I'm just going to make it up. Dave, but it would be like Dave um, Sewell at yahoo.com. And that guest list would then send out an email to the players that's below. You, so you can either copy this link and send it out on your own, or you can have our system send out that email. Now, one more part about this is that the system operates by distributing a portion of the budget of the game to the players, and you can distribute um, uh, anything from 0% to 100%. Um, you distribute 0% if you want to make the players do something to get money, uh, and, uh, and there's some special applications of that. Most of the time, you're going to pick 40% as the, as the option, and, the, and this is what is in this slide deck. It kind of talks you through how to go through these processes. And it gives why, you uh, why 40 percent? Pardon? Why 40 percent? Um, we don't have a scientific answer to that. We have a decade of experience that says between 40 percent and 60 percent is the right number. If you distribute, and I have it, this described in my book, if you distribute less than 40 percent, people get really frustrated because they can't buy enough. If you get if you give too much money, people get bored because it's too easy to buy everything and even unimportant things. Mm. Um, and this actually deals with game psychology. Ask yourself, would baseball be fun to play if you could have seven strikes before you're out? Yep, yep. Right? There's this balance of making something hard but not too hard. And what we have found is that that balance seems to be about 40 to 50% to 60%. So now your party is ready, and, and you can see the games, and then you've experienced the lobby and playing the game. And then this is where we analyze the game results, right? So to, to make our final choices, I go to my system, right? And I'm going to go ahead and uh, uh, cancel this. But, if, but to make my final choice, just like I did before, I would click my results. I'm going to skip the BCG demo, and I'm going to download this into Excel, and then I'm going to open up Excel, and I'm going to look at the pattern of purchases and the pattern of statements. So again, here were my uh, items in the game. Here were the players that played these games. 
here were the final game boards of the games that I played. Here's the bid stream of all the players time stamped. Here's the final bids of the players. And then here's all of the chat sequences that will associate it with the game. So the other team that has uh, Lars and Craig and Peter and Nancy, you can see how they played the game, and I can start to, to, to look at how you guys played the game. And that's, that's pretty much the full checklist. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to stay longer, but we've hit our two-hour time limit. But this is, this is fundamentally uh, the, the deck that will be your reference, and this is where you'll also sign up for an account, play a few games, and, of course, I'll be at your service to answer any questions on this. So uh, can I ask a couple more quick questions? <clears throat> oh, please, please, absolutely. Um, how much, as a facilitator, other than the actual time for the game, um, how much time needs to be budgeted for one of these games in terms of prep and then, more importantly, the you know, sort of analysis and debriefing piece of the results? <clears throat> and then the set part two of the question is, with the notion of how much time it takes, um, how, how do most of your facilitators charge their clients? Yeah, um, I've got I, I've, I've sent you some notes on that, and and those are those. Uh, let me rephrase. I'm about to send you some notes on both of these things. Um, in terms of let's let's take the how do people charge? Um, people charge either hourly or day rate. Or when it's market research, many market research projects are based on per respondent pricing, like a survey. So if you were to go, if a client of yours was to say, would you run a survey, and you were a market research firm, a very common way to do it is to say, I'll charge you $100 per completed survey for prep and analysis. And we actually find that that's a fairly good indicator for our system. So you could go to your client and you could say, I'm going to charge you $150 or $200 per completed game with a player, we expect to have 50 players, so that's a $10,000 project. Um, and that's not a bad pricing model. Um, the other model is time, and, and the other model is fixed price. I would advise against fixed price pricing until you have more experience with the tool itself. Um, and uh, in terms of prep, um, I would say that the safest way to price your projects is to do a, a two-step process. Get the list of items that they want to play and make an assessment of the quality of the list. Uh, you know, when I work with Daimler Financial Services, there's almost zero prep time because their strategy team is monitoring those projects like a hawk. And the project lists are very clearly defined with very solid estimates. I've worked with some startups um, who, who have project names and descriptions, but, the, but like the projects don't have benefits. And so I'm like, look, guys, if you really want to make this compelling, you got to tell me what the benefits are. And then I work with them to get the shirt size prices in terms of uh, the, the shirt size estimates, and that gets into the uh, a projected price. So that might take me um, – two billable days over a two-week calendar time period. So when I'm doing pricing of projects, I tend to separate billable time from calendar time. So to, to, give, you a, to give you a rough estimate, let's say that you're doing this for the first time and your client wants you to do 20 items with 40 players. I would allocate two days for prep over a two-week period. I'd allocate two days for play over a two- or three-day period to you know, handle scheduling. And I would allocate two days for post-processing and writing of your report. And I'll send you guys example reports of the, uh, that we've written so you can kind of see the style. And I know you know how to write a report. And I know you know how to write a report. But... Um, um, I think that that's a safe thing to go. Thank you. Okay. Um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and um, um, say thank you to everyone. I'm about to send you a whole bunch of information. 
and I am going to follow up with posting this webinar in YouTube and get you that link and all that kind of stuff too. Thank you very much, Luke. Thank you guys Thanks. so much. Uh, okay, now I have to figure out how to stop this. <laughs> Unplug. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.